Welcome. Welcome and thank you all for joining us for the sixth event in our fall programming series, Freedom and Captivity. The series is co-organized by Catherine Besteman of the Anthropology Department, Chandra Bimul of the African American Studies Program and Anthropology Department, and Gwyn Shanks of Theater and Dance Department. I'm Jill Gordon, the NEH Class of 1940 Distinguished Professor of Humanities and Professor of Philosophy at Colby College. We want to thank all of the departments and programs across the campus who have offered support for this series and to acknowledge the Black School for their beautiful graphics. Freedom and Captivity, supported by the Center for Arts and Humanities at Colby College, explores a set of interrelated questions. What does it mean to be free? What forms can liberation take? And how do we articulate and enact an abolitionist vision now? Tonight's event is a conversation about solitary confinement, the practice used as a tool of control and punishment in prisons. Our guests are Lisa Gunther and Jackie Sumel. Lisa Gunther is Queens National Scholar in Political Philosophy and Critical Prison Studies at Queens University in Canada. She's the author of Solitary Confinement, Social Death and Its Afterlives, 2013, and co-editor of Death and Other Penalties, Philosophy in a Time of Mass Incarceration, 2015. From 2012 to 2017, she facilitated a discussion group with men on death row in Tennessee called REACH Coalition. And she was a member of the P4W Memorial Collective from 2018 to 2021. She is currently working on a critical phenomenology of prison abolition and decolonization on Turtle Island. Jackie Sumel is a New Orleans-based multi multidisciplinary artist and abolitionist whose work at the intersection of activism, education, art, contemplative practice, and kindness critiques the American legal system. She has spent the last two decades working with incarcerated persons, most notably her 12-year correspondence and collaboration with political prisoner Herman Wallace, who was held in solitary confinement for over 40 years. With Wallace, she created The House That Herman Built, an exhibition, installation, book, advocacy campaign, and Emmy Award-winning documentary. Wallace's death three days after his release, when his case was overturned, led Samel to create solitary gardens, garden beds that are the same size and shape as the solitary cell where Wallace was confined, confined and are designed by incarcerated people. Solitary gardens ask viewers to imagine a landscape without prisons. Lisa and Jackie will open the discussion by responding to a question that I will pose and then they will pursue questions of their own with each other. Following their conversation, I will return to moderate questions from the audience. Throughout the program this evening, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box. Our framing question for this conversation is this. What drew each of you to the hard work of examining and exposing the brutality of solitary confinement and what do you each hope most to accomplish with your work? We'll begin with Lisa. Thank you so much, Jill, for that introduction. And thank you to Chandra and Catherine and Gwen for organizing this series. Uh, I've been tuning into the videos before this conversation and I've learned so much from the exchanges so far. Um, so in response, oh, um, and I'm joining you right now from Jojage, which is also known as Montreal, on the unceded territory of the Ganingahaka. But I teach at Queen's University, as Jill mentioned, which is on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee land. Um, but where I first started thinking about solitary confinement and learning and connecting with people in prison was in Nashville, Tennessee, where I used to teach at Vanderbilt University. And um, really my introduction to thinking about prisons was a graduate seminar that I took while I was um, a professor, like a new professor at Vanderbilt with Angela Davis, who came for six weeks and she was a visiting scholar in our department, in the philosophy department. And so we read W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. We read Cydia Hartman's work. We read a bunch of different things. Um, and 
that seminar really opened my mind to abolition. It was the first time I'd ever actually conceived of that possibility of actually building a world without prisons and police. Um, and one of the texts that, um, I'm not sure if we were actually reading this in the seminar or it's just something that I picked up when, you know, in that time when I was just like trying to figure out where have I landed? Where do I live? And what are the forces of power that shape this place? Um, but one of these texts was um, In the Belly of the Beast by Jack Henry Abbott. And in that text, he compares solitary confinement to a kind of living death. Uh, and he says that it that level of sustained isolation messes with your ontology, like the basic relation to your own being and becoming. It messes with your relation to time and to space and to your own body. And so I sat with that thought for a couple of years, really, thinking very carefully about what he could mean by that. And in the meantime, I was reading work by Angela Davis, Asada Shakur's memoirs, uh, George Jackson's prison memoirs, and I also encountered Jackie's work in that, in that, those first years of trying to learn about the prison industrial complex and specifically about the form of violence that is solitary confinement. And so I read about Jackie's uh, exchange and collaboration with Herman Wallace. I learned about the Angola Three initially through that collaboration. And learning about how Jackie reached out to Herman and asked him this question about, you know, how he survived in uh, an eight by 10 or eight by 12 cell and what kind of space could he imagine living in beyond that space um, made me realize that I didn't just have to kind of sit there with my rage and my despair and feel helpless, but I could actually reach out to people whose work was inspiring me, such as Russell Maroon Schultz, who was just recently released on compassionate release after being in prison for over 40 years and in solitary confinement for over 30 years. And he had written this amazing text, Dragon and Hydra, where he was comparing different organizational uh, strategies. Like the dragon is this top-down militaristic kind of uh, really colonial supremacist, white supremacist form of uh, organizing. Um, but the Hydra was a model that Maroon communities used, a kind of multi-headed, multi-pronged, uh, pluralistic model of organizing so that there's no one leader and no one center of the movement. And so it was through an exchange with Maroon, through letters, and eventually a connection with some um, people that I met in Nashville that I started working with folks on death row at Riverbend Maximum Security Prison. And while they were not in solitary confinement at the time, like we were able to sit around a table and gather and talk about um, philosophy and poetry and politics, they had all been in solitary for at least two years. That's the, you know, they began at this security level that had them in their cells for 23 and a half hours a day. And then if they could make it through that for a year without any rule infractions, they would go to level B, which was uh, 22 and a half hours a day in, in their cell, locked in their cells. And if they could make it through that, then they could be sort of at a more minimum security level participating in groups and, and gathering with each other. So I would say that my aim initially in this work was just to understand, uh, both to understand the practice of solitary confinement, um, where it came from and how we could abolish it. And it, it took a little bit for me as a, as a philosopher and an introvert and a bit of a geek to actually realize that I could participate in helping to build move, abolitionist movements. Um, and one of the things that, uh, since I've come back to Canada and am learning from scratch, the way that 
solitary confinement and the prison system work in Canada is that the language of abolition can be appropriated by a government like in Canada uh, in response to um, court decisions, the federal government announced that they were abolishing solitary confinement. And so all of us were like, what? Uh, that sounds awesome. But, um, but instead of actually abolishing the practice of solitary confinement, which I think cannot be abolished without abolishing prisons themselves, they've rebranded the practice and adjusted it, modified it somewhat so that it's called structured intervention now, and you get a little bit more time out of your cell and you should have access to healthcare consultant. And um, so one of the things I would love to talk about is just the slipperiness of this language of abolition, which is um, so important to hold on to as this radical vision of not just a world without the buildings that we call prisons, but a world without the logics that structure those buildings and practices and also structure the world beyond prisons, outside of the prison walls that we inhabit, those of us who have never been incarcerated in our lives still inhabit. So I will leave it there and pass it over to Jackie to talk about how she got into this work. And uh, then we'll start talking to each other. Hey, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and I also want to shout out and lift up everyone who's been dreaming about these um, and building these conferences organized around prison ab abolition, PIC abolition, um, and a landscape without prisons. It was actually just ruminating on it today that, you know, I'm sure Lisa has this experience too, where, you know, I'd say like five years ago, it, it would be an absolute miracle or like somehow the conversations of my work would be held in the context of some other space or some other conversation like you know here's so and so and so and so oh and that and this abolitionist you know and then it would be like abolition 101 and now i feel like you know we're reaching a critical mass that um makes abolition accessible from so many different points i love this idea of the hydra um, although I've, I've never named it that, um, it, I definitely relate to it. And I think of my work very much like that. It's like, you can, um, you can access abolition or abolitionist values, principles, or tenets from so many different ways of being and existing. So yeah, I just wanted to honor that. Um, and to follow up, I also, uh, I'm in, in the city that they call now call New Orleans, um, Bulbancha, the unceded ter territory of the Chitima Chitimacha, Homa, um, and Choctaw. Um, and I've been here um, about 16 years. Um, I live here because of my relationship with Herman um, and the work that I did with the Angola Three. Um, so thank you for um, for bringing that into the conversation. Um, you know, Lisa and I had a real quick conversation earlier today. Um, and I think what is really central um, and stitched us together is Herman Wallace. So I want to acknowledge the life and legacy of uh, such a remarkable man and elder um, for whom I would not be here or have these opportunities. Yeah. So thank you for bringing his name in early. Um, the question is, how did you get into working around abolishing solitary? Um, yeah, also an unexpected path. Some might call it a, a, a series of accidents. Some might call it a series of miracles, just pretend, just assuming, you know, whatever your orientation is. But um, I often tell this story, like in 2001, Robert King came home after 21 years of solitary confinement, wrongful conviction in Angola prison here in the state of Louisiana. And at that time I was living in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And um, you know, no one's really, this is like pre-Michelle Alexander. There's, it's not a national conversation around mass incarceration. Let's just say that. I'm sure, you know, Russell and, and Hooks and Wood Fox were all talking about mass incarceration um, at that time. But we weren't collectively as a society or addressing the harms of the 
you know, war on drugs, war on the poor. And so I just happened to have a crush on this organizer in the Bay Area who was part of bringing Robert King out. And, you know, I remember he told me, he said, you know, there's this guy, he spent 29 years in a six foot by nine foot cell for crime he couldn't commit. He's a Black Panther political prisoner, prison called Angola, somewhere in the state called Louisiana. Do you want to go? And I was like, oh, oh yes, totally. I want to go. You know, that's the only thing I heard. And, um, you know, San Francisco is not nice uh, to bicycle around, but I, I, was, I was biking. And I remember on my way there, I got cut off by a SUV. Um, and this is 20 years ago, you know, very different human form of, of the person that's talking to you now. So, so please forgive me when I, when I share this story. Um, the SUV cuts me off. I throw my bicycle down. I pull my earrings out. I'm screaming like F U M F -er, you know, like going to throw down with this total stranger who may or may not have seen me. You know, I, I, he drives away. I reapply my makeup, walk up the stairs of the luggage store gallery, and I sat in front of a man who had just spent 29 years in isolation for a crime he couldn't have possibly committed, which was longer than I had been alive. And he wasn't visibly angry. I almost went fisticuffs with a total stranger. This dude had suffered way more harm than me. And, and somehow he found a way to transmute and change that and be an alchemist, right? And I was like, shit, I got something to learn from him you know, and it just, I felt very drawn, very called. And I listened, you know, at the end of hearing King speak, it was super awkward. He had just come home. Um, everybody was silent. Again, it was like, we didn't have any context for the language that he was using of these kinds of abuses and violations and solitary in general, these horrific conditions. And at the end, it was just like this awkward silence. And I just raised my hand and I was like, is there anything we could do? You know, like I'm not, I'm not even a fully, like I'm not even a fully formed human. I'm like, a, I'm a student, you know, whatever. Like, I just was like, I don't know. And he said, yeah, you can write my comrades. You can write Herman Wallace. You can write Albert Wood Fox and you can let the prison know that you know they're alive, you know? And I listened and you know, that began, began a very long and circuitous journey, which has been, you know, central to my life's work. and has really gifted me with um, in, in, the incredible horrors of our collective humanity. Um, but I'm sure you know this too, Lisa, like the unbelievable beauty, you know? It's like, you, you know, that you, you find in, um, in our humanity and, and in the resilience of humanity and the way that folks um, really on the inside are leading the abolitionist movement. Um, is uh, I feel nothing short of blessed for that, you know. Um, I think uh, it's obvious how or why I have stuck with this for 20 years, you know, the intimacy of my elders and understanding, you know, how Albert Woodfox, how Herman Wallace were forced to endure these inhumane conditions for 41 and 44 years respectively, felt like, you know, it was the most important target for me to address as an abolitionist. And that, you know, Angela Davis, right? She, she asks us to think about prisons as solitary within our society. Very often, I know this is true for Maine. I know this is true for New York. You know, these institutions are removed from our everyday sight, sound, smell. We're not, unless we're, you know, got homies inside, family inside, beloveds inside, we're not thinking about them. We're not thinking about our prisons, jails, and detention centers on the regs. And yet, you know, so it becomes a solitary within the way that we are organizing. And so within that, to have a more concentrated form of that amnesia and that torture felt like, uh, like the target for abolition. For me, it felt like, you know, the little boy in the dam, you just, you know, like that, if we could just pull and eradicate solitary, the whole thing's got to come down. Yeah, that's how I got here. Um, yeah, I'd love to open it up for the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I love how you mentioned alchemy because I feel like I've witnessed a kind of alchemy in your work in collaboration with Herman and inspiration by Herman and in collaboration with other folks that you're living with in New Orleans. Uh, because one of the things that has happened is you started, you know, with that question 
to Herman. Um, yeah. How does someone who's spent, I think at the time it was like 32 years in 29, you know, 29, 29 years in a six by nine foot cell, uh, imagine like a dream space, a space that you would actually want to inhabit. Um, yeah. So could you t talk us through like the alchemy and the transformations of that project of designing a home to solitary gardens and what you've been doing since then? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, Herman was a great teacher in so many ways. Um, and, you know, there's infinite amounts of gifts that he has, you know, bestowed and also, you know, challenged and encouraged. And, you know, there's like many ways that he had to meet me so I could learn to listen, you know? Um, and, and, and within that is this trajectory of like, you know, we're working together. I asked him what kind of house does a man who's lived in a six foot by nine foot cell almost 30 years dream of. And then we were figuring it out together because I was like a very young artist. And we didn't know if we were gonna make it an art project or like if this was just me and him, you know, and we just had to listen. And, and you know what I realized, Lisa, I, don't, I, I bet this is true in your world is like, you know, I'm talking about this person that I love who's being tortured in the criminal punishment system, right? Who has been tortured. And there's all these things that are like undeniably wrong with the situation, but people just don't have the capacity for more of sad, you know? there's very, we don't make it easy to access that. But that's not the muscle that we're exercising. And then, you know, I'd be like, I'd be like talking about his like mirrored ceilings or, you know, the gardens or, you know, how I would retrofit this house. And then he'd be like, could you just add some smoke detectors? Like all the details that he could see and they'd listen. And I was like, oh shit, there's something here. You know, there's a way to get people to pay attention to Herman Wallace's life and legacy through this art project. And we got to go. Like we got to do this, you know, and the objective was always and still remains um, to build this man's dream house, to build the dream house of a man who was in isolation for 41 years, right, who transcended and ascended in all the ways you could ever imagine um, and, and gifted us with his vision of a dream home. Um, and, you know, after this, the October 1st, 2013, Herman's conviction was overturned. Um, he came home and he joined the ancestors three days later. You know, I said in the beginning, I live here because of Herman. Like, I wasn't going to live in Louisiana. You know what I mean? Like, I came here to organize on his behalf. And when he joined the ancestors, I was like, Man, what am I doing here? You know, it's like immense grief. And I was like super disoriented. And, you know, I realized I had like thousands of letters, literally, over the course of the 12 years that we corresponded. And, you, you know, you go back with these like grieving eyes and you're, everything's different, everything. And I realized how much Herman Wallace talked about gardens and plants and flowers. And, you know, he used to make paper, every, you know, like paper flowers and how revolutionary that was to be kept in concrete and steel for 41 years of your natural life and dream about gardens, right? Be able to see them, smell them, feel them. You know, in fact, when I asked him what kind of house he dreams of, he dreamed of, he said, I can clearly see the gardens and they will be full of glaxinias, delphiniums and roses. And I wish for guests to be able to smile and walk through gardens all year round. And then the second thing he asked for was a swimming pool with a light green bottom and a, and a black panther in the center. So, you know, like he had his priorities straight. So anyway, so I knew there was like a way to uphold the life and legacy of this remarkable human doing um, through the language of gardens, through growing, um, through the natural world, through what is ultimately the antithesis of, of prisons and jails, right? The antithesis of this like footprint of concrete and steel and that rigidity. And, you know, again, just learning like, yo, you got to listen. Um, I was walking around New Orleans visiting a friend's house and they had like just a regular garden bed. And I was like, whoa, that's almost the same size as Herman's cell. And it was just like, boop, 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 download, you know? And then I've spent the last, that's 2015, six years growing these garden beds that Catherine alluded, uh, sorry, that Jill alluded to. Um, the garden beds are six by nine. They're the same size as Herman's cell, same blueprint, grown in collaboration with folks who are inside, 
Um, and so, you know, all through that forgotten language of letter writing. And what I think you said something that I thought was so beautiful about um, the rebranding um, and how it makes possible systems of punishment and control. You know, and I, um, the garden beds themselves, they, we grow sugarcane, cotton, tobacco on site. And then we grind it down, we add it to a non-hydraulic lime. So these prison cells turned garden beds are made out of the largest chattel slave crops um, with the intention of illustrating the evolution or the rebranding of chattel slavery into mass incarceration. So yeah, um, that is, uh, this is, this project like a hydra has grown and like the, like the earth, right? Has like, has grown all of these new ideas and new ways of collaborating and new ways of being, um, yeah. That's wonderful. Amazing. And yes, you're so right. Like rebranding is basically like a way of pretending to change without changing. So if yeah. like slavery was rebranded as the, the prison system, as the convict leasing system, uh, we're going to get, we're going to abolish slavery, except for those who have been duly convicted of a crime. And suddenly we get prison slavery um, and we get a, a different, it's a different elaboration of the practice of, you know, extract, violently extracting uh, value from uh, the bodies of people of African descent um, and, and growing these crops. Mm. Uh, but then when you come along and kind of transform the plantation, you in collaboration with a whole bunch of others, right? Yeah. Transform the plantation into a garden beyond the beyond that logic of extraction and of domination. Then we can see like the literally growing um, beautiful things that sustain our lives and that teach us so many lessons. Mm -hmm. uh, you shared with me the the abolitionist field guide that you created in collaboration with others in New Orleans. And I was just blown away by that because it's like, it's also about a practice of listening and paying attention and feeling what plants are doing. They're not, they're not speaking to us in words we can understand until we can sort of like attune ourselves to a different kind of language and a different kind of rhythm. Yeah. And then, and then we start to learn about how plants help each other to grow, um, about how nothing grows without connection and relationship. Like nothing can be safe and healthy and thriving if it tries to wall itself in and defend itself and find safety in isolation or of oneself or of others. Right. Um, and so there was something in the in this field guide, abol abolitionist field guide, where you kind of walk us through the relationship between the cover of a book and uh, and the water cycle. And you mm -hmm. ask, see, like, can we see the cloud in the cover of this book? Oh, yeah. And so it's like tracing the paper and the cover of the book to the trees that um, have gifted us this paper. To the, to the water that feeds the trees, to the clouds that, that gift the water. Yeah. Um, and that for me is such a beautiful way of kind of like shifting also just our ways of seeing and paying attention from any given moment to the whole process of how things are interconnected. And for me, that's, some, that's one of the teachings of abolition. Um, that abolition, we can maybe get a little hoodwinked by um, the rebranding of abolition as something like um, structured intervention or whatever, if we don't pay attention to that whole process and that whole cycle. But if we can kind of like do this shift, it's like a gestalt shift, <laughs> and see those relationships, then we're, we're learning from and listening to plants and and our relationships with other people in ways that's kind of already practicing abolition now without having to wait for this end point where suddenly the world would be awesome because there are no prisons and, and police. Um, but how do we actually bring that about without that patient listening and building and growing? 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love hearing you speak about, um, you know, uh, I, I mean, obviously your book has been like a critical text in, in formulating ideas around how we end up in a society that is willing to keep folks in isolation for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and I don't know if I ever told you this, but you know, Wretched of the Earth, Herman gave me a library list and I, I'm super dyslexic and I really struggle with reading. Um, and I was like, all right, can I, can I start? It's like, you know, 70 books or something. And I was like, can I, can I just read one? And he said, no, but if you're gonna, it's gonna be Wretched of the Earth. And so, you know, just like the different ways that you, um, uh, can frame and give access to um, uh, or make accessible these ideas that I think are really important. And I think, you know, one of the things that you're talking about really is, um, is like a, 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 a way of not only a way of seeing, but a way of existing, a way of being, um, a way of feeling that is completely embodied. Um, and that I and that Fanon talks about also in Wretched of the Earth, you know, and the disembodiment um, that that accompanies uh, extreme isolation and punishment and, and racism. You know? <laughs> but um, but I do think that, you know, to that point, um, it's not an either or it's not like you can understand and read Fanon or and or and you can't. So you're listening to nature. Right. It's a both and. And I have learned so much um, abolitionist strategy from the just the way that plants um, exist within each other, right? And it's it's metaphor, it is storytelling, it's the history of plants getting uh, traveling without legs or arms or wings, right? It's all of these different strategies for survival or survival that um, to me are really organized around abolition as practice rather than destination. And I think this is a human habit that is ultimately really dangerous. And, you know, as an abolitionist, I don't wanna tell anybody, you know, this is the rigid meeting of, of abolition. This is, this is like the goal and then boom, we're all liberated, right? Like I think um, the nuances and the complexity of it is like, is, as you said, it's a complete shift and, and an undoing of the rigidity or the need to know or the need to get or go or have, which is you know foundational to not only white supremacy, but racial capitalism, you know, and the, the ways that the society has been gilded in terms of its value. And so I think it's really exciting to kind of unwind that and be in relationship with the natural world and really listen to the ways it's telling us, you know, how to be better humans. It's not only, you know, abolitionist strategy, but I think if we're, you know, if we're willing to, to really listen, then we can, um, we can hear, we can feel, we can experience, we can receive uh, the solutions for so many of the social crises that we've created as ignorant human beings. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned unwinding and unlearning and kind of unraveling the, the, um, the walls that we've built uh, mm -hmm. to let, uh, I love your term, sir, Sur survivance, <laughs> <laughs> not just to survive, but to thrive. Uh, and one of the th things that I've really been thinking a lot about since moving back from the US to Canada is that like, there were no prisons on Turtle Island. We live on a continent where prisons and police, like we have historical precedent in fact, the entire world has historical precedent of a world without prisons and police. Like these things were invented, we built them. And so we have to unbuild them. And I think that your solitary gardens are like, they kind of help us to see how that unbuilding, like one way of imagining that unbuilding, like let's take this cell, strip away the walls and use the bars as like support for, for plants to grow. And when a plant is not growing well, this is something I learned from the abolitionist field guide. 
you don't punish the plant. You try to figure out how, how is this plant, what does this plant need? What is it not getting right now? And how could it survive and thrive? Yeah. So, so I feel like there are lots of lessons from indigenous peoples about like precisely those kinds of practices that are not about separating and isolating someone um, who's not thriving, but trying to engage with them in a way that creates a space for relationships to unfold in ways that are less harmful or that can address the harm that's already happened. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Something you just said, just, I was like, boop, 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 you know, um, just like a light bulb went off, but I do think but people are often like, you know, how do you, where do you begin? Like, how do you start to identify as an abolitionist? Like, what does it take? And for me, arguably the most important ingredient is, is the first one, which is, you know, a sense of wonder, like curiosity, right? And because I think that leads us to really inspiring our imaginations at activating, like the imagination. Herman was able to leave his cell through his imagination. That's a superpower, right? And like an abolitionist has to be a really courageous dreamer to dream beyond what we know, what we think is normal. And to the point of what you just said, is like folks had to use their, no F-bombs in this talk, folks had to use their imaginations to come up with the carceral system that we see today. And they had to make it so damn good and so like sound so great that we bought into it and we think it's normal, right? So unwinding that boop, 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 and then using our own sense of imagination, which is that superpower to really vision what could be next. I don't know if it's, you know, I think it, I do think it'll be informed by indigenous practices. I think that it, there's deep, deep healing potential in that reality, but I don't know. And I'm not going to say that's it. That's not, you know, it's like, I, I want to listen to the ways that folks are dreaming and scheming and believing um, that we can exist without police surveillance or prisons, you know, but also I don't think that abolition is, is you know, is I, I, I know you believe this too, like abolition is not just about eradicating the landscape of police surveillance and prisons. Like it's the intimate ways that we, um, that we take care of each other. Yeah. And, or don't. And so I, I, I do think like there's always an opportunity to exercise principles or tenets of abolition at any given moment in your day, you know? And, and just like anything you wanna be good at, to do that as often as possible, to just say like, yo, I want, I believe in abolition. I've heard Miriam Kaba speak, right? Like I, I've, I've read Lisa Gunther's book, whatever, I, I saw Jackie Summers' exhibition, whatever it is that inspires you. And then you move with that. And like anything you, you wanna be good at, you really commit yourself to practice. And like, and like you know, you mess up, great come on back like this is so robust and big um as a practice and as a philosophy abolition you know that it's oh it is willing to take it is willing to welcome us back no matter how hard we we like f up fumble i'll use miriam's word fumble no matter how many times we fumble you know yeah um maybe this is a, a good i think um question to just toss back to you in, you know, cause I think you and I get, can be seen almost to a fault in these roles as, you know, philosopher, professor, artist, organizer, whatever. And then that's who we exist. But maybe I would love to hear a little more about the ways that you, um, that you sort of like poke holes in those identities to create a more robust, life as an abolitionist and someone who is like obviously lifelong committed to this work yeah oh that is such a good question and I was going to ask a version of that question to you <laughs> especially about kind of like the university and I imagine the art world although I'm not part of that world has certain 
rules, norms, ways of functioning, ways of kind of like making things legible in its own terms. Uh -huh. And that is so at odds with the way that we're called to relate and respond as abolitionists that I feel like um, in this moment right now, like I, in the last six months, I feel like I've gone through a lot. I do not know how to answer your question because I don't feel like I'm, I'm balancing in a, in a really kind of nimble way the living within, but also trying to live against and beyond the, the confines of an institution like the university. Um, and also the confines of um, the cop in my head, the, the, the various ways that um, that whole system of trying to deal with harm through control, separation, and isolation um, is an extreme violence against the people who are targeted as wrongdoers, as lawbreakers. Um, and at the same time, there are all kinds of invitations and uh, exhortations and emotional and embodied ways in which those of us who are not targeted for that kind of separation and isolation and punishment are kind of like encouraged to stay within a rigid little box to identify mm -hmm. safety with some kind of protective shell. Um, and, and so it's reading your, um, uh, abolitionist field guide and and the way that you're engaging with healing and the necessity for healing in that text made me think of uh, a book that one of my former students recommended to me, My Grandmother's Hands, which oh, looks yeah, you know so what? good. Yeah. It's amazing, huh? It's amazing. Yeah. 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 And and so the author really kind of talks through the different embodied emotional ways that that people can cling to and cleave to systems that are really not good for anyone um, yeah. and that are like, like destroy lives, but also diminish lives. And it makes me think of something that James Baldwin says about whiteness, like they preferred safety to freedom. Mm. So the desire for freedom is at the heart of abolition. Mm. Um, but there are times when like that, freezing up or that numbness and that rigidity that uh, that is all about choosing safety over uh, abolition. Um, like one can feel it's sort of like deep pull in a way that teachers like Herman Wallace, like Maroon Schultz, um, like Yarrow, like Dandelions are just so wise and so necessary. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, so I also fall into this, you know, perception of like, and it's a tough one, you know, when you're, when your closest homies are like on their 28th, 29th year of isolation and you get a, uh, award, or, or some, some fellowship or something, you know, and it's like, oh, 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 it doesn't, you know, it's an imperfect system, right? And, you know, I contended with this a lot with Herman, you know, and uh, in terms of like, is, is this unethical to like find safety in these worlds or be rewarded for playing air guitar with solitary confinement for 21 years, right? Um, and I don't, I don't have a perfect answer. Um, and I, I have, you know, I have blessings and permission, which I, I know you do too, you know, because I think there is a both and where you, um, and, you know, not to out you, but like have put yourself in very uncomfortable positions in order to like understand what safety really is, right? It's not just something that you're like, 
oh, you know, kind of status quo is defined by this, but like the willingness um, to extend yourself beyond, um, you know, the, the, the sort of normy idea of, of where reward and value comes from. Like, I, I think about this often, like, it's actually, you know, it's okay to like want a nice house. It's, it's okay, right? It's okay to want like a, a car or like a boat or maybe like some jewelry, you know, these like material things. It's, it's actually, it's okay to want to like, I don't know, bulk up your resume. I don't know, fall in love, all those things. But like in the hierarchy of like what you are focused on, like where it exists, you know, matters. And like Herman used to always say, you know, like he has never doubted that the top, my, my top priority in this world wasn't, you know, my house or whatever, my face, you know, whatever it might be, you know, but it's like it, the top priority for me is liberation, you know? And being able to love, um, uh, 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 like being able to, to love quickly and to be kind quickly. And so like those kinds of priorities, I think, um, you know, just like checking in with yourself, like gut checking yourself, but also not punishing yourself. If you're like, yo, it, like actually this cup of tea, like, this makes me this makes me feel better and be able to do this work for the long haul because it is a, it's a marathon right you know um but but you kind of alluded to this and i, I wanted to ask you know because is abolition what's the framework for this is harm the only thing that abolition addresses um say more about the the question yeah so i think you know like you were saying at the very beginning in the different ways that there's like this, um, you know, abolition as you didn't say this per se, but it can be co-opted, can be fluid, can like move into all of these different realms. I think oftentimes they still get stuck to or attached to abolition as a solution for uh, the prison industrial complex, right? Which ultimately has been sold to us as like, um, you know, the, the institutional way to address harm. Is abolition, um, you know, a practice that only applies to addressing harm? No, I don't think so. And, and that, I think, would to limit abolition in that way would make it only a, a negative or dismantling process. It would only be a kind of like reactive, okay, there's harm, we need to we need to heal it. Um, and it's not just about um, reacting to something that's gone wrong. It's mm. also, as Miriam Kaba teaches us about building, it's about imagining, it's about loving, as you just said. Um, and those are all the creative expansive ways about kind of like exploring and experimenting with ways of being that might feel scary to us and unknown, but that that's, that. so I guess that's how abolition, it means freedom, trying to be free, struggling to be free, but also just like practicing and rehearsing uh, freedom as uh, Ruth Gilmore teaches us. Yeah. So all of those are the, it's not just, that's not just about reacting, uh, reacting to something that's gone haywire, but about opening up and 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 being like those little tentacles of like when plants grow and they're looking for something to climb on, that reaching for yeah. um, for for otherwise possibilities. That's already a kind of embodiment of those possibilities. I think it's not about like the the goal but about that process of, as we've already talked about. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. I love mm -hmm. that. I think it's also important because it's so easy to, to, you know, sort of assign abolition as a solution to, uh, alternative to incarceration, right? But I, it is omniscient in, the, in those ways, 
you know, it's emotional, it's relationship, you know, it is, um, it is, you know, baseline and, and skyline, you know, and I think, um, yeah, I, I, I'm glad to hear the way that you frame that and those little tentacles, um, we, we don't have to get into this right now, but I have a couple of tattoos with those little tentacles. (laughs) Anyway, anyway. Um, we yeah, were we were talking about maybe you showing some images of the solitary gardens and apothecary. Are you still into that? Or yeah, you- how are you feeling? Or I don't know if there's any questions in the Q and A that folks um, have lined up. Um, I'm happy to do either. I don't know if Jill or uh, Catherine has an opinion on that. Hey, Jill. Hi, I'll just pop in briefly to say, Jackie, why don't you go ahead and show us some of the slides and that'll take us probably up to the eight o'clock hour. And then we do have some questions in the queue and we can get to those. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Okay, share screen. Can you all see that? Okay, dope. so, you know, I, um, I feel like it's important because this is like, you know, as Lisa said, this is where we met each other and, you know, so much of the shared experience of what really moved and, and, and transmuted and changed us is our relationship with folks inside, um, which arguably is fueled by the practice of, or the lost art of, of letter writing. Um, on the left are, are my elders, that's Herman Wallace, Um, Robert King and Albert Wood Fox, the Angola Three. Um, And as y'all know, I spent 12 years collaborating with Herman, um, uh, designing his dream house, the house that Herman built. And those are some of the letters on the the right side. Um, That really beautiful project, which much like abolition, you know, was about relationship and this unexpected yet magical, uh, relationship between this lady that was like, you know, Stanford grad student on this like trajectory or path that was like highly rewarded in this Black Panther in a, a carceral institution in Louisiana. Like, whoo, how did that happen, right? And like moving with it. And, you know, Herman and I um, really, you, you know, in, in no uncertain terms, um, changed the world because we believed in each other, right? And trusted each other in these deep and profound ways um, that wasn't always encouraged. And, you know, one of the ways that that manifested was the exhibition. So this exhibition is on tour now um, with uh, Gina Dent and Rachel Nelson's Barring Freedom. Um, So you can see Herman's cell, that six by nine cell, um, juxtaposed to different iterations of his dream home. So sometimes there's like, the little model or um, there's like a fly through CAD video where Herman's reading um, his letters and other things. It's just like really showing the power of his imagination to transcend these unbelievable um, conditions. And so, you know, that um, cell I built dozens of times and became really intimate with it and, you know, and in, in doing so, you become intimate with the 80 to 100,000 men, women, and children that um, are kept in isolation at any given point in our collective history in the colonized United States. Um, and so when Herman um, transcended, you know, again, just like visiting those letters and knowing that that cell um, was so important to uphold his life and legacy and to like also continue to illustrate the inhumanity of solitary confinement. You know, so you could see here, just thinking about how I could take that cross section and then build these garden beds um, that are actually six by nine. Um, But within the garden beds, the only place that you could grow is where the human being can move. So what's blocked out is the bed, the toilet sink, the desk and the chair. And you can see here some of the correspondences and how we translate um, incarcerated individuals visions into the ground and in this really beautiful way you know the garden beds become portraits of those who are condemned arguably to the worst of our humanity you know this desire to just continually punish um, 
and so, you know, in, in building these garden beds around the country, there's now like an abundance of, you know, teachings and abundance of wisdom and abundance of plants. And so again, just learning to listen. Um, we've been taking these, um, all of the plant material and playing and um, started working on the prisoner's apothecary, um, which is an entire apothecary of plant medicine grown in collaboration with folks who are still incarcerated. And, you know, for me, it feels like, um, you know, that in this way that individuals who are and oftentimes have caused harm, right? Like my work, my heart, my life doesn't rely on innocence to have compassion for or relationship with human beings who are incarcerated, you know? So folks who maybe who have caused harm are now given a unique opportunity to offer healing um, to the communities where they may have caused that harm, right? So I think in some ways this transcends um, our understanding of criminality or restitution or redemption. So plant medicine is an offer back to communities that are directly impacted in many different ways. Um, and one of those ways is that we are building out uh, a holistic abolitionist cafe and diversion program here in New Orleans that's based on the model of the solitary gardens and the prisoner's apothecary. And doing that in collaboration with two uh, FIPs, Jerome Morgan, Robert Jones, who are exonerees. Um, and so the idea is that um, this cafe will, um, is plant, we, we call it plant abolition powered, right? So using the plants, um, growing them in collaboration with young folks who are part of this diversion program who are, who are basically learning from the, the new set of elders from Jerome and Robert, um, and then literally how to undo. This is like the, the curriculum that they um, have written is all about undoing, right? So that they um, can exist um, and thrive in a world that, um, that wasn't necessarily meant for them to do so. Um, and so, you know, the cafe itself is valued on the principles of abolition and mutual aid as an antidote um, to racial capitalism and white supremacy. Um, and, and also that, you know, healing is a huge part of this and the ways that we can literally and figuratively heal and grow together. And I, I included the slides so you could see all of us together. But um, we've been doing this monthly, first of the month mutual aid um, events that are incredible um, and, and, and collaborating with different folks, different nonprofits in the community to really share the abundance, which is antithetical to racial capitalism to say like, yo, we have all of this abundance, like let's do this together, let's share and, um, and let's grow stronger together. Um, and the cafe itself is called uh, Ngombo Cafe and um, it's based on it's Ngombo Cafe and Sanctuary. So Ngombo is the Bantu word, African indigenous word for what we call okra. Um, and it's based on the story of okra making its way into colonized soil here in the United States, uh, braided into the hair of the enslaved body as they struggled to survive the Middle Passage. And um, Dr. Jury Augusto um, talks about this so beautifully, the ways that you know, these seeds were planted in, in the colonized United States and then these big bright yellow flowers, you know, that the colonizers had no idea what that was, right, are blooming and they became beacons of home and hope and survival and strength to folks who were being uh, moved around uh, the plantation south. Um, and so we want this cafe to be exactly that, to be like this beacon of home and hope and possibility and to really you know center and champion the lives of folks who are formerly and currently incarcerated and to like really you know encourage these cultural shifts to you know I, I sometimes talk about it like like to be able to see folks who have endured the prison industrial complex and its far-reaching grips you know in with the same hearts that we can see veterans, you know, that they've endured the impossible that is a result of our either collective inaction, right? Or collective intention or inurement to punishment. And so, yeah, that's what I'm working on is crazy, yeah. 
Great, thank you too so much, um, really stimulating. So we're gonna turn now to some uh, comments and questions from the audience. So I'll start with our first one. Um, uh, one of our audience members says, hey, I don't have a question, but I just wanna let you know that I've done two years in segregation myself, off and on, but six months at a time. And there were times that they didn't give us showers, outside recreation, hygiene, clothes, water, hot water, visits, phone calls, classes, literally nothing. And you're absolutely right. It's not helpful at all. I went absolutely insane. My head felt crazy. I didn't know what to do with myself. I felt like all I could do was smash it off the wall because all they did was keep taking things. I couldn't get myself out of the damn hole. They weren't teaching me anything from that form of punishment. I was just getting more and more angry, more depressed, you know? You wanna comment? I mean, thank you for sharing that, you know? We need those windows in, you know? Yeah. Thank you. And, and that, that way that you're describing the whole like within the prison and the taking away, stripping away of everything uh, that you need to, to survive and to thrive. I think that's built into the very um, practice of incarceration. Like a prison is never just one box. It's always like a box within a box, within a box, within a box. Mm -hmm. And that those different levels of deprivation whether it's like formally in the name of teaching a lesson or rehabilitation or redemption or whatever, um, its logic is to squeeze every little bit of living uh, tissue out of you and to have survived that and to have come through the other side of that, I think um, demonstrates incredible strength and power. So thank you for sharing that comment. Yeah. Okay, so our next question is, um, Lisa says in her introduction to solitary confinement, there is no individual without relations, no subject without complications and no life without resistance. Samel's garden work also begins with the individual vision of a prisoner and then creates community with those who build those visions into material reality. Could you each talk about your conception of the subject and the community, their relationship and the role of that relationship in your work? Lisa, you go first. Okay, that's I don't a big that question. Much about it. Yeah, you go, you go, you go. Um, so for me, one of the, one of the philosophical traditions that, um, I feel helped me to listen to what, or it kind of like tuned my ears to what some people in solitary confinement were saying about their experience of both feeling that deprivation and also surviving it and somehow coming out uh, the other side. That philosophical tradition is phenomenology. And so from a phenomenological perspective, you're not just an individual unit you are a relational being in the world. And that's why solitary confinement can mess with your you know, memory, your capacity to, to see clearly and to perceive. And you know, getting back to what Jack Henry Abbott said about his experience of solitary confinement, it can literally feel like the structure of your being is being broken down at the hinges. Why? Because we are hinged, we're relational, we're um, multidimensional. And in the phenomenological tradition, um, you know, we don't just see a, a table and a chair as three-dimensional objects because that's built into our brain to, to process it that way. Yes, there's all kinds of stuff going on in our brains and in our whole body, but the, the practice of seeing something as... Um, as a whole with hidden sides, as well as with a side that presents itself to us is a kind of, it emerges through a kind of interplay between my perspective, which is rooted in my body 
and that I don't share with anyone else in the world. And yet when I share space with someone else and I'm looking at the table from this direction and I can imagine my way into their perspective, looking at it from the other side, that's how I get a kind of rounded, fully fleshed out understanding of the world. And so when I read about, um, you know, some of the testimonies of people in solitary who had um, undergone like perceptual distortions where the edges around objects began to waver or the mesh in their door, cell door sort of quivered. Um, mm. it, it rang a bell for me because I was coming out of this philosophical tradition that already saw human beings as relational and that and so it helped me to make sense of what was going on when if you deprive someone of their relationships like a lived everyday relationship with other people in shared space then those all of those um capacities that we have that we form together in collaboration with others are things that we have to sustain by ourselves and support and prop up by ourselves. Uh, and that can, can literally make people like crack apart. But that violence is only possible because we are relationships. And I think, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that um, I've learned both like from, from reading prisoners testimonies and talking to people who've gone through solitary alongside that philosophical tradition. Jackie, do you want to respond? I mean, it made me think of the first time that um, I visited Herman, you know, and again, like not knowing what I was doing, I just like got on a plane from San Francisco, like rocked up in New Orleans and then drove to Angola. And, you know, I, I went, um, uh, I went with uh, actually the organizer I had a crush on, we ended up dating, so it worked out well. So we went together. And, you know, sometimes when I'm nervous, I'll just like braid my hair, play with my hair. And I had made these tiny, tiny, like single curl braids in my hair on the like three hour drive from New Orleans to Angola. And at that point, Herman was in Camp J, um, which is more punitive than solitary. So solitary confinement in Angola prison is called CCR closed cell restriction. That's 23 and and, and one, right? 23 hours inside the cell, one hour outside. J was the more punitive version of that where there's no natural light, you're like denied basic amenities, sometimes like clothes, like Herman was without clothes, only in his underwear, no socks um, for months at a time in the middle of winter in Louisiana. Um, pens, like you could only have uh, the tip of the pen and the, the writing tube, you couldn't have the, you know, like all of these things, the food, they serve something called the loaf, which is the leftovers from the day before that they put in a big vat. You know, like Jay is explicitly designed to torture people, which is something we really, like we really need to examine. And, um, and so, you know, here I am going into this prison, greenish, greenish shit. And I'm like, what is this place? Like, you know, how does this happen? And you, you, you go into Angola and it's like, you time travel. You're like, whoa, this is like 1850. What is going on? Like literally on this like bus from the 1930s or so. Yeah, like diesel bus driving through black men working the field, you know, which is soybeans, cotton, you know, predominantly in Angola. White dudes on horses with guns. You're just like, wow. You rock up at Jay and it was around Christmas. It's Christmas 2001 and they had like a Christmas tree decorated with uh, barbed wire, with razor wire. And I remember I just engaged the guard and I was like, do you, do you think that's funny? Like, do you think that's cool? Like, you know, I just, it was like so mind blowing. And um, she was like, you're not from here. And I was like, no, <laughs> definitely not, you know? And anyway, it was just like, you, you know, you get, you get locked in these container tanks moving. <laughs> And then finally get to see Herman, who this journey is, you know, organized around. And I walked in and I can't see him because he is in this container, visiting container with two offset screens that you described, you know, 
So this, I just see like a shadow kind of moving. And he, and he says, oh, I like the plaits in your hair. And I was like, what? And he's like, the plaits look cute. He could see these tiny braids in my hair. I can't see his eyes, right? And I'm like, how can you see that? How can you see those? And he said, he's like, kid, you get used to it, you know? And it was just like, oh, this guy, how, how could you get used to this, you know? And just this unbelievable, like the fortitude, you know, to, to not quit and to actually believe and to dream and to like maintain your imagination, you know, or that as Miriam Kava says, discipline of hope is just mind blowing, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, next question. Um, throughout the conversation, you've mentioned ideas like Ruth Gilmore's rehearsal for freedom, otherwise possibilities, or simply the notion of imagining something radically different from our present. How are plants, their care, their growth, their medicinal properties, particularly or specifically key to enacting and engaging those frameworks for abolitionist praxis? I'll hit that one. Um, I mean, you take a seed, right? This little tiny thing, you put it into the soil, you put some water on top of it, and then boom, like, you know, the, the soil breaks open, there's this little cotyledon, and then the next thing you know, you know, you're tending to it and it's growing, which I think is, is nothing shy of a miracle if you're thinking about that, right? Like, and that, you know, when it is in its tiniest, most vulnerable form, those first two leaves that are identical, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a passion flower or corn or fennel, like the, it's all, everything that that seed needs to grow is contained within it. That is amazing, right? And the, call it imagination, but the, you know, everything that had to go into creating that kind of perfect system is, is a miracle, right? And so I, I think, you know, that is just one example of the ways that the natural world inspires or encourages us, you know, to, to be better people. You know, I think there are specific plants and specific qualities. Lisa brought up yarrow, you know, yarrow for me is, um, is like one of the plants that um, I love to talk about, you know, yarrow is this, um, is, is considered a weed, um, is oftentimes targeted with pesticides and fire and all of these ways to eradicate it. You know, it's considered like uh, invasive in many places and all of these ways that we've sort of rigidly identified it as unwanted. And yet the plant itself has so much medicine for us, right? And historically, and it's, you know, um, it is a symbol of protection. It is a symbol of boundaries, um, historically, not just on Turtle Island, right? The medicine of yarrow as, you know, uh, a blood mover, um, as a styptic on the outside of the body, like it stops your blood on the outside of the body, you take it internally and it gets your blood moving. That's unbelievable, right? Um, the idea that you can have yarrow tea if you if you feel like you're catching a fever um, and yarrow will move the fever in the direction it needs to go, right? Sometimes you need to raise your body temperature to break the fever. Sometimes you have to lower it. And yarrow just knows. And, you know, in the garden itself, um, yarrow, um, when you break the roots apart, when you cause trauma to the roots, that is how it prefers to grow. So the, that is how it will propagate more strongly. It's not with gentle hands, right? And, and I, I will say also say like the, um, if you plant yarrow next to other plants that, um, um, you know, produce oils. So like your mints or lemon balm or whatever it might be, yarrow encourages the production of oils in those plants. Cilantro, it doesn't matter what it is. And so it's this like selfless thing through the rhizomes that it's encouraging the other plants to grow. I mean, I think all of those ways are examples of behavior that are 
not only abolitionists, but you know, um, are things that we can and should aspire to do. Yeah. Okay, um, Lisa, you're good. <laughs> I am blown away. Like I knew some things about Yarrow, but not that whole range. And I and I totally agree um, that each plant has a whole range of teachings that that require kind of like a slowing down and listening. And it, what you were talking about made me think of um, an essay that someone I worked with at Riverbend who is. Um, on death row, his name is Hutch. He wrote this beautiful essay about, um, you know, he took a life and he, and he uh, owned up to that. And he wrestled every day with the, with the violence he had done um, to others and the way that violence still kind of rattled around in his own body. Mm -hmm. But where he found um, the discipline of hope was in his yard time. And yard uh, in unit two, uh, which is the death row unit at Riverbend, is a cage um, with cement. And it doesn't have uh, concrete walls around the, around the sides, thankfully, but it's like a, like a chain link cage, not bigger than a dog run. And, and so Hutch would go out there and just like put his fingers through the, enough through the holes in the, in the cage to just touch the grass. And he talks about like how a leaf one day managed to make itself into the cage and that this was just like the most exquisite thing. And he just held it up to the light and, and saw all of the, the, the webs of uh, connection that were in this leaf. And so in this space constructed on some moralistic level to uh, hold Hutch accountable for the life he took, um, a space of death that, that deprived him of um, all of the capacities that he had to grow and figure out how to grow himself in relation with other people in that unit. Uh, he found this little um, spark of life in the grass and in the leaf. And I think he would have been super interested to hear about uh, the powers of Yarrow as well. He has since passed, sadly, but, but that's one of the things that he taught me about, about the connection between um, survival and thriving and, and uh, connecting with living things as teachers. Yeah, there's a book, uh, I just want to shout it out, um, uh, called Braiding Sweetgrass by, yeah, Robin Wall Kimmerer. And um, that, that was a pivot point for me to have, to like awaken, to just like, you know, get curious about these relationships. Um, and I, I strongly recommend it. I mean, it's an audio book was how I was able to come to understand it. But, it, you know, it's, I, I think, yeah, it's, you know, I do think our prison's obsolete, fumbling towards repair. We do this to be free as emergency strategy. All of those things are really important in the abolitionist library. But I also think braiding sweet grass should be there. Um, yeah, as we figure out, yeah, different ways of seeing. Thank you. Okay, um, next question is for Jackie. Um, how do you understand your practice's relationship to New Orleans? Has the city informed in particular ways how the various tendrils of your project have developed? Oh yeah, uh, this city is intense, you know? And, you know, I often say New Orleans is, you know, it's, it's a swamp and this city has so much power. And as a swamp, it'll suck you up, it'll take you in, it'll make you stay. I didn't want to live here. You know, I, it just was like a sequence of events that um, were un undeniable that I was meant to be here for as long as I have been. And I know that New Orleans, when she's done, she's just gonna spit me out, you know? And there's so many ways 
uh, blessings and, and, and unbelievably painful moments that I've experienced in the city. You know, there's a realness to New Orleans that I, um, that I, uh, I think is unique. You know, I remember one of the, the I saw this graffiti um, in the wake of Katrina that said US out of New Orleans. And that made a lot of sense to me, you know? And I think about New Orleans as like, I talk about it like it's a, a magedy. It's like equal parts magic, equal parts tragedy all the time. Um, and so New Orleans as like a, a teacher in abolition has really taught me that you, you can't deny one and just focus on the other, right? You have to exercise the capacity to hold both true at the same time. Like Herman, you know, conviction overturned, released from prison October 1st, joins the ancestors three days later. Like this unbelievable tragedy that this man spent 41 years in isolation for a crime he couldn't have possibly committed passes three days after his conviction is overturned, holds the same amount of space as the reality that Herman Wallace died free, innocent in the eyes of the law and surrounded by those of us who loved him most, right? That they don't eclipse each other, they coexist. And, and New Orleans teaches us that every day. Um, Jill, I know that question yes. was meant for Jackie, but could I say a little bit about, um, where I live, which is so different from New Orleans, uh, Kingston, Ontario, Canada. It is the prison capital of Canada. Like we have the highest concentration of prisons. We have the first penitentiary in Canada. Uh, we had the first and only federal prison for women in Canada for 70 years. And then once that closed down, it spawned this whole federal system of regional prisons for federal prisons for women and you know the incarceration rate for women went way up it is a prison town and it's also a military town and it's also a university town and the you know like one of the things i was thinking about when uh i read in in the um abolitionist field guide like can we see the cloud in the cover of the book i thought can we see the limestone quarry in the football stadium that is literally built in like on the former prison farm uh mm. in the bowl created by the the forced labor of people at kingston penitentiary like there's a whole part of the campus of, at the university where i work that's built on this hundred acre prison farm that mm. you really have to slow down to be able to see because it's all it's all built over and so, you know, like New Orleans is in some ways uh, maybe the prison capital of the world, like just in terms of the rates of incarceration there. Yeah. And there's an intensity and ferocity to that. Um, but there's a different kind of quiet violence um, in Canada's prison capital that I'm still trying to figure out. And um, somehow it feels related to me to these trees that I think are teachers, but then what are they trying to teach exactly? Mm -hmm. These black walnut trees that, uh, that grow in the yard of the place where I live. Uh, and they're gorgeous trees, huge, like ancient ancestors. And mm -hmm. they suppress the growth <laughs> of all these other plants. They secrete like vapors, they secrete um, uh, toxins through the soil. Their leaves you can't use as compost because uh, they will suppress the growth of, of most other plants. So they they tolerate and and accommodate some plants, but but they, I guess they one of the things they teach is are boundaries. But mm. but I feel like there's some alchemical work that that the that the black walnut um, needs to help us do in Kingston, both to unearth the toxins that are in that soil, like literally in the soil of the, of the prison farm that we walk upon when we walk across campus. And in the rocks, the limestone that's been extracted from that quarry that built Theological Hall on campus, for example, 
Uh, and yeah, maybe it is some kind of lesson about, about boundaries, but it's something that I haven't really figured out yet. But I just want to kind of talk about that place and the way that like violence can be totally on the surface, mm -hmm. uh, but it can also be kind of a little bit quiet and buried and, and require a bit of digging and messing around to, um, to be able to see so that healing can happen. Yeah, and to that point, Lisa, um, solutions can also be the same, right? Like we can see great legislative changes and shifts. We can see, you know, completion of the 13th Amendment. And we can also experience like very subtle, quiet moments that embody the values of the world we, we want to live in. Yeah. So um, this might be our uh, last question for the evening, um, and it's a, a good one to end on something um, constructive and for people to think about um, as they, um, you know, take their leave uh, from this conversation. Can either of you or both of you offer suggestions for the best ways to confront and overturn solitary confinement as a practice of carceral institutions? Is it working to impact public perception? What makes the difference to actually move us toward a society that refuses to do this to people? This question relates to the current campaign in Maine to prohibit solitary confinement or what Maine Department of Corrections calls confinement. I mean, I will say one of my elders, Bali Mu Johnson used to say, it takes all the tiny grains of sand to hold back the oceans of oppression. And so I, there, I don't believe there's a single recipe or a single grain of sand, right? It's like all the little things that we contribute together to shift um, what is necessary, which are, you know, tidal changes in our response to harm. Um, and, and, you know, within that, as, as we work together to have these major cultural shifts, which for some of us, like, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a baker or a banker or a student or a lawyer or an artist or a philosopher, there's always something you can and should be doing. And then in those list of priorities, move that to the top, right? It's something every day. And then within that, we start to build the momentum of all those tiny grains of sand together. Yeah. That is beautiful. I love that image. Uh, and I totally agree. Um, and I guess the only thing I would add is also be vigilant about rebranding uh, mm. because um, and 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 talk to people who are who have experienced solitary confinement to figure out what it would mean to abolish it uh, rather than rebrand it mm. um, because. <clears throat> It's possible to, this is one of the one of the tensions between abolition and reform. It's possible to move a little bit in the right direction, but in a way that um, feels like an endpoint to uh, governments and administrations. But con to be vigilant and constantly holding open the horizon of abolition as an ongoing practice, I think is is super important as part of that. Uh, multiplicity of grains of sand that are that are all important and necessary in doing that work. So I want to, um, I guess I will just end by making an announcement and then saying something um, to thank our speakers. The next event in the Freedom and Captivity series will be Monday, uh, November 15th, that's next week. And we will welcome activist journalist Victoria Law, who is going to be talking about gender, feminism, and abolition. So please join us for that. And I just want to say thank you to both Lisa and Jackie for what, for me anyway, has been really not just edifying um, and a learning a few moments, but also really moving in parts. And, um, I'm just grateful to both of you for what you've shared and the work that you've been doing. So thank you. Appreciate you very much. And this was an honor to share this time with you, Lisa.
So wonderful to talk to you, Jackie, and thank you, Jill, for facilitating and to all the organizers for bringing us together. This has been really wonderful. Yeah, yeah. You all have a beautiful night. Be easy. Yes. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you.